So, um, no matter how many times it's been pronounced dead, the nation still resurfaces as a key kind of category through which people identify politically or through which different political ideologies are articulated. And particularly in the wake of the Windrush scandal, hello, John. <laughs> Um, particularly in the wake of the Windrush scandal and the um, Scottish independence referendum, um, the rise of nationalist governments across the global north, and with Brexit looming ever closer on the horizon, ideas around national identity and what it means to belong to a community are once more at the heart of our politics. So this panel is going to address Labour's historic relationships with communities of colour, um, and ask the question if nation, whether or not nationalism has a place in the labour movement, whether it's possible to win over an electorate and challenge racism at the same time in a context of heightened xenophobia, and we're also going to be thinking about the future of citizenship under labour. So I'm going to introduce our panellists, and then we will kick off, because you came to see them, not me. Um, Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, so we have Ash Sarkar, who is a senior editor at Navarra Media and a lecturer in global politics at um, Anglia Ruskin University and the Sandberg Institute. We have Kojo Karam, who is a lecturer at Birkbeck Law School, um, and his research interests include questions around international law, empire, and race. We have Morris Glasman, who is a political theorist, Labour peer, and the founder of Blue Labour. And we have Josh Denham, who is the former Secretary of State and the director of the English Labour Network. Um, so, Ash, we're going to start with you. So, um, oh, crap. I heard it, I've heard it said that you can't even say you're English anymore. Um, otherwise, they'll lock you up and arrest you or frown at you or make you feel that you're some kind of uh, illiterate, racist bigot. And uh, I've come here to echo all of those sentiments and then I'm going to go home. Um, I'm, I'm actually not interested in questions of identity, which sounds like a strange way to start off this discussion. And also, I helped write the copy for it. So um, I'm just going to say that I found my own copy very boring. I'm not interested in identity. Do you want to identify yourself as British? Go for it. You want to identify yourself as English? Go for it. You want to identify yourself as European, a citizen of nowhere, part of the People's Republic of Palmer's Green, even better? Um, go for it. Um, to me, that is not either an interesting or a powerful question, because it's a question which on some level doesn't need to be asked or challenged in people. Where do you belong? The answer is obvious. The answer is wherever it is we find ourselves, how we uh, identify ourselves within the community in which we live. For me, the much more interesting question is not where do we belong, but how do we belong? What do these processes look like? What are the mechanisms of exclusion? And then perhaps as a backdrop to it, which I know that um, comrade Kojo Karam will elucidate on at length as well, why do we belong? What are the um, historical forces that shape it? On this question of how do we belong, it's never quite as simple as simply being born in a place or being able to move to a place. I'm not an immigrant. I was born in North London. I've hardly ever moved from there, apart from one brief sojourn to South London, and then no one came to visit me, so I moved back. Um, but still, I am racialized as a migrant. The process of racialization doesn't care about facts. It cares about a structure of feeling which has had decades, if not centuries, to be formed. Similarly, when we think about this process of racialization, how arbitrary it is, I think about what it means to be racialized as a Muslim. So I'm a Muslim. I've never claimed to be a particularly good or observant one. I'm waiting until I hit 30, and then I'll you know, change my ways. Um, but I'm still racialized as a Muslim in this country, 
in other countries that I go to, I'm not racialized as a Muslim. An example of not having to be Muslim to be racialized as one is John Charles de Menezes, shot and killed at Stockwell Station, not a Muslim, but brown enough to die as one. And this is really important for thinking about the nation state, for thinking about how these arbitrary processes of racialization, which fundamentally aren't about how we see ourselves, but how we are seen by the state apparatus, by how we see one another and how we construct a social reality, all of these things affect whether or not the nation state is itself a malleable enough container for a progressive or indeed a radical politic. The reason why I focus so much on race when I talk about the nation state isn't because I think that nation states are necessarily inherently racialized, but because in practice and in history, nation states are. The formation of nation states and the formation of race as a technology of governance, these things happen at roughly the same time in history. And what's interesting to me isn't just the twinning together of uh, race and nation states as both fixed categories, but that both have been remarkably kaleidoscopic. They go through periods of change and transformation according to different uh, social, political, and economic needs at different points in history. And I think that since the end of colonialism, the end of empire in this country, there has been a trauma a collective trauma from which this country has never really recovered. And in the words of one of my esteemed panelists, Kojo, and also a friend of mine called Karam Nijanjolu, it is the trauma that Britain had its arse handed to it by peoples that it considered racially inferior. So immigration becomes a much more loaded question one, not about our identity and how we see ourselves, but how we are seen by the rest of the world. It is a constant reminder of this trauma, right? The idea of um, these peoples who had, you know, handed Britain its arse, coming to this country, making demands of it and demanding to be seen as citizens and not subjects is inherently a challenge to British national identity and how the state functions. And so then we see these processes which inhibit our ability to belong as citizens like anyone else. Some of these uh, social processes are informal, um, if not uh, explicitly backed by the state, or sometimes policed by the state. So we're thinking about um, you know, racial harassment, you know, racially targeted hate crimes. These are crimes. But we know that these crimes aren't uh, taken nearly as seriously as crimes against other members of society. I think here of Bijan Ibrahimi, killed in Bristol a few years ago because he was racialized as a Muslim. He was racialized as a migrant whose pr very presence was an inerrant threat. And so after being targeted and harassed by pretty much his whole estate, he was murdered. His lawyer um, accused the police of institutional racism in this regard. So here's an informal but deeply powerful, deeply violent social process which inhibits our sense of belonging in the nation state, the experience of racism and violence. And then there are laws which are shaped and not necessarily inherently racialized, but in practice they are racialized. So something like the prevent agenda, which to me, well for me, hits particularly close to home, because as a teacher, um, as someone who lectures, it inhibits my ability to have open and frank and direct conversations with my students in teaching. I'm scared that one of them might end up getting reported to police, or I myself might get, end up getting reported to police. We know that disproportionately, the prevent agenda affects our ability as Muslims, or indeed people racialized as Muslims, to exercise that foundational premise of democratic participation freedom of expression. And then there are, then there are um, processes which are formally racialized processes. And here I'm thinking in particular of immigration, detention, deportation. We remember the new labor era as an era of cosmopolitan values where there is a state multi multiculturalism in which we can all feel represented. Right? It's an inherently diverse project. And there are things that I think we should look back on and celebrate. 
The McPherson Report was a huge step forward. The Race Relations Act 2000, another huge step forward. But one of the funny things about the Race Relations Act 2000 is that a certain group of people were made exempt from it. So, in a sense, could racially discriminate. Those people were immigration enforcement. The Race Relations Act 2000 was essentially calling open season on Tamil migrants, on uh, Somalian migrants, on Afghan migrants. So these are all things which inhibit our sense of belonging. So what's our solution to this as leftists, as progressives, as people that want to see, as all of us want to see on this panel, a Labour government? Is it fighting anti-racism in terms of what you can or what you can't identify as? Is it merely a project of uh, endless critique and analysis? No. We want a point of traction, right? And I think that that point of traction for us and our central demand will have to be a re-interrogation of citizenship itself. How can you make citizenship, which so far has been a process of excluding many people of colour and people who are racialized as other in different ways um, from the body politic, how can you make it a much more inclusive project? Well, perhaps rather than thinking of citizenship as a set of rights conferred by a state, as a set of obligations that we all have to our community and to our society. Rather than thinking of citizenship as something that you pay for, quite literally pay for, we could think of it as a mandatory obligation which you have after a certain amount of years in residency. Now this was once a core part of anti-racist movements demanding residency rights, not just citizenship rights. And then we can think of what some of those politicized obligations that we have are. Perhaps it is uh, making sure that your tax money is paid in the United Kingdom here. And then we can start calling into the question the citizenship arrangements of those financial elites who seek to benefit from our society and yet not pay into it. This is the kind of anti bold anti-racist uh, policy making that the Labour Party should be embracing. We can't just tinker around the edges of an unjust immigration system. We have to strike at the very heart of it and upend what it is it's meant to do. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, up next we have John. Okay, you... thank you very much and very pleased to be here. Um, I want to make four uh, brief points. Um, one, to agree with Ash, uh, before almost completely disagreeing with her on the question of identity, not in what she said about fighting racism, but on the identity issue. The point that I agree with her is there is no right or wrong and there is no must about identity. If it doesn't matter to you, it doesn't matter to you, and you don't, if you're not English or British, that doesn't matter. It's not a saying there should be an identity that everybody has to sign up to. But in terms of whether the left should respond to these questions of identity, we do disagree, which is why I'm here, I think. Um, I want to argue that the left, and not just in this country, but certainly right across Western Europe, needs to learn to argue its politics, in part at least, in the language of progressive patriotism. Secondly, I will make a few points about the evolution and importance today of British and English identity, and I want to share some thoughts finally about the left's response. I start from this point. If our politics are for the many, not the few, it raises the question of who are the many. The many to people on the left, to people who are socialists, can't be a, a, a statistical construct, just a list of all of those who are not part of the 1% or part of the 5%. For democratic socialists, the many, if we're going to change society at all, must have a sense of who they are as the many. They must have a shared identity, a set of responsibilities towards each other, and a determination to work together to build a different society. This is not a matter of simply electing a government that's going to make things better, even if you can get the government elected in the first place. For much of the left's history, the core of that many, that sense of shared identity, was born in the unionized industrial working class and the communities and collective identity that they shared. 
But because of economic change, not political change, that core class consciousness is today much weaker and shared by fewer people because fewer people have that experience. But people in societies across Western Europe, being people, still crave a sense of shared identity. And if you like whether we like it or not, increasingly that identity is expressed as the identities of nation, of people, and of place. And the problem is that the left across Europe has failed to respond or engage, partly because of its distrust of patriotism and of national identity. It's been left to the right to engage. So the right have been allowed to define nation as something inward-looking and hostile, the people in ethnic terms, and it's taken root most in places and amongst people who feel that they have lost most from globalization. And the failure to engage is a real problem because of a fundamental feature of democratic politics. Before many people would engage with policy or ideology, they ask a much more visceral question. Can I trust this person? Can I trust this party to stand up for people like me? So if people feel patriotic, and whether this audience does or doesn't, doesn't really matter, because most people do feel patriotic, and if there are rather more people in England who feel English more than they feel British, and if Labour comes across as anti-patriotic, if Labour seems to ignore English identity or worse, disparage it, then we fail to make that very important initial connection. These people, they think, will fail to stand up for people like me because they are not people like me. And of course, Labour often does come across like that. Now, not everybody feels like that, of course, but many people do. And very often, they are people that we should want to represent because they're the people who have suffered most from globalization. And we actually need them to vote for us because they live disproportionately in the smaller English towns we must win at the next election and they make a larger part of the electorate there. So if Labour does not come across as a patriotic and English party, I'm not saying that's all we should be, of course, but at least in part, we will do badly, we will probably not win. But that means thinking about our identity more cleverly than we often do. Because identities are complex, and both our major identities in this country, English and British, which are the most commonly held, they're both contested. They're both contested between right-wing exclusive ideas and progressive inclusive identities. Now, I would argue, we'll see what others say, that compared with 40 years ago, we have had significant victories in the argument about Britishness. And I would argue that we're much closer to winning arguments about Englishness than many on the left assume. Let's remember that 30 years ago, many on the left argued that Britishness would never be open to non-white communities because of its association with imperialism and racism. Yet today, it's black and minority ethnic communities who are, if anything, more likely to identify with Britishness than the country as a whole. And that change was largely brought about not by the goodness of white liberals, but by people who are not white demanding the right to be British on an equal status to everyone else. Now, Britishness, of course, and we've touched on this, is partly an argument about an equal citizenship in which everyone is fully included. Englishness is not a citizenship because you cannot be an English citizen. So it's more of a cultural struggle. And partly because English is not a citizenship, it has become widely understood as something you get from being born here. Not being born to white parents, but by being born here. So it's not as easily available to new migrants. As we saw this summer with the football, the idea that you have to be white to be English is very much a minority view and less so amongst the young. The left, by ignoring these questions, has actually made things worse. We allowed the far right 40 years ago to take the Union Jack, and we're in danger of allowing groups around Tommy Robinson to claim the St. George Cross. Yet 80% of the people who live in England say they feel strongly English. Now, that either means there's an awful lot more fascists than most of us have been counting on, or actually there's an awful lot of people who feel English, are proud to be English, who aren't associated with the far right. And a final point. If we don't engage with Englishness, because it does have some right-wing associations, 
We cut ourselves off from the radical elements of English history. And so, as I'm getting the nod, I'll make this the last point. This is probably my 42nd Labour Party conference. It's extraordinary, really, if you put it like that. But when I used to come in the 1970s and listen to Tony Benn, you often got, in part, a lecture about English radical history, about the levellers, the Chartists, the Peasants' Revolt, because they were an explicit part of his socialism. And if we cut ourselves off from Englishness because of its right-wing associations, we also cut us off from part of our own history, which can still be part of our own inspiration. Thank you very much, John. Um, next up, we have Kojo. Brilliant. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. This is actually only my second Labour conference, so not up to 42 at the same levels as John. So in terms of electoral strategy, I will probably defer to my other panellists. But what I instead want to talk to you about is to um, share with you a little bit of my analysis of the way in which the narrative around Britishness and the way in which the narrative around our own national history um, is often a missing part of our understandings of the potential potency that nationalism can be as an organizing political principle. Specifically, what I want to focus on is the extent to which an imperial amnesia tends to color in our understandings of what Britishness is and what it can be in the 21st century. Um, I hope to win you all over to this argument. Um, firstly, because Ash has introduced me as someone who goes around bragging about how I handed English people their arse, and you know, I grew up around these areas. I know how dangerous talking about handing people's arse can be. So I um, want to first of all qualify my understanding of that a little bit further, but also because I think it's an important part of trying to understand what this particular political moment is within the United Kingdom. So it's interesting to be here talking about nationalism again as an academic. It wasn't so long ago that with the rise of globalization, it was commonplace for academics to talk about the end of nationalism, um, a rise of integration within different countries, um, bilateral and multilateral trade agreements such as NAFTA, ensuring that there's greater economic coherence between nation states, um, the supposed promise of supranational organizations like the European Union, like the Organization of American States, like the Economic Community of West Africa, you know, seem to indicate perhaps nationalism no longer being a significant question in the 21st century. But um, when academics often name something the end of, whether it's the end of history, end of nationalism, that's often the kiss of death. So if you ever see anyone name anything like that, it might be about to make a political resurgence, and that's what we've seen with nationalism everywhere from the Philippines to France, from Turkey to the United States. And so I think that leads us here in the United Kingdom, a country that has always had a certain distaste for overt flag-waving um, kind of the crude nationalism of places like the United States, it leaves us with a question of how is this going to influence and infect politics within this particular country. And for me, when thinking about nationalism within the United Kingdom, I think you have to start by understanding that the project of Britain was always an imperial project, as in it wasn't, it's not, it's not accurate to describe the idea of Britain as a nation that had an empire. It's part, it's more accurate to think about Britain as being constituted by the empire itself. From the Act of the Union, all the way through the allegiances between the different functions of the United Kingdom, the imperial project both produced and sustained the United Kingdom. Up until decolonization in the mid 20th century, an ease of transition into supranational organizations like the European Union, and you could even argue that at this particular historical moment, we're actually wrestling with the question of what it means to be an independent British nation for the very first time. Why that's particularly relevant is because I think it runs completely counter to the narrative of Britishness that we all often accept. Due to a perception of an island nation due to a history that's 
in fact, marked by moments of ideals of anti-imperialism as opposed to imperialism, Britain has a quite, a, a quite distinct national story from its perhaps recorded history. If you think about the kind of most familiar moments of national history, whether you're talking about the defeat of the Spanish Armada, whether you're talking about the defeat of Napoleon in Waterloo, whether you're talking about the um, narrative of Britain standing alone against the fascist threat in the Second World War, these are ideas of an independent island nation state standing up against an imperial, imperial aggression and I think this is something that the Brexiteers understood very well. That's how they narrativized what the Brexit moment was. The idea that Britain needs to be independent again against the imperial ambitions of the European Union. That's a pretty unique national story, or a pretty confusing national story for a country that had the largest empire in recorded history in terms of scale, population, in terms of landmass. Um, And I think that this is something that's very much erased within our own understandings. Um, it's something I like to do with a few of my students to show the extent of which we have a certain imperial amnesia, um, as opposed to the debate around whether we should be proud of our imperial past or whether we should be ashamed of our imperial past. I argue to my students, we don't know about our imperial past. It's completely erased. And um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes, or just a minute in fact, we only have a couple of <laughs> minutes left, to share to see, to see whether this thing works out with this audience. It doesn't work out with my students, but you know, they're young undergraduates. I'm sure the savvy, well-transformed audience will be able to overcome this. And it's a very simple game I play called Did Bring Colonize or Not? Where you offer two different countries, one of which was part of the British Empire, the other one wasn't, and to see how many people able to identify the right country. So I'm just going to start off with a couple of examples as we're running out of time. Um, one example um, is a combination between Kuwait and Qatar. One of them was part of the British Empire, one of them wasn't. Can I just get hands raised for who thinks Kuwait was part of the British Empire? Can I get hands raised for who thinks Qatar was part of the National Empire? Better than usual. So it was Kuwait, correct? And that was the majority, absolutely. Um, can I ask um, another one, um, Lesotho or Gabon? Can I ask hands up for Lesotho, which is part of the National Empire? Yeah. Can I have hands which think Gabon was? Again, the majority do choose Lesotho, but a few people did, of course, choose the wrong countries in both examples, and a lot more people decided not to put their hands up because they were like, I have no idea. <laughs> And I think that that reflects, like I say, this amnesia that we have about what Britain has been and where Britain has been. And without an understanding of the scale of the British Empire, I think it's very difficult to try and use nationalism as a vehicle through which to understand a lot of the problems that are facing this country today. Without a full interrogation and understanding of the scope of empire, I don't think we can understand issues such as the crisis around the Irish book question that we're facing at the moment without understanding the British imperial history. We can't understand what is the trajectory that even makes the stage have the demographics that it has today. What is the trajectory that brings people from Ghana or from Bangladesh or from Egypt or from Jamaica to the United Kingdom today? Where are those paths coming from? What is the economic division of labor that led to the kind of separation and wealth that we see between the north of England and the south of England? Why are cities like the city Liverpool, like other northern industrial cities that were built for specific purpose, suffering with an industrial decline in the post-imperial stage? Without a full understanding of British Empire, I don't think we can answer those questions. And I think that that should be um, something that anchors any debates that we have around what it means to be British or English. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Kojo. And closing these opening remarks, we have Morris Gladsman. And thank you. Um, really lovely to be here. Even better, because I just found out that Spurs have gone one up. So that's an unusual thing. And, and, and basically, my head is sort of exploding with things. So I'm just going to just begin with a with, with, a, with a couple of thoughts that I pick up. So I've got, I'm very uneasy with this word progressive. 
as a way of talking about this. I tend to think that it's quite an um, evasive term. I, I usually say it's the last thing you want to hear when you go to the doctor, isn't it? It's progressive. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's just to pick up on this idea that perhaps the least true thing that was ever said in a political campaign was things can only get better, right? It's just not true at, at, at any level. And that's what progressive is, this idea that there's this arc of history and things are going to get better. And I think that what we're confronting now is a genuine threat from the right, a real populist threat from the right that has to be understood democratically and has to be understood in class and race terms. And if we can't get to grips with that, we're going to be, we're really going to have a progressive illness where we are going to gradually die, really, without really being able to understand why. That's the, so the first thing I wanted to say was that when we're talking about this stuff about the nation state and the construction of the nation, um, we've got to look at the stakes that are involved because if we can't advocate a democratic and inclusive democratic politics that can engage in the resistance of the domination of capital and at the same time articulate a generous democratic politics in which all can participate as citizens, we've lost it. Because there's a, what Gramsci would call a war of position on. And John and I are old enough, it's very nice that you're not, but we're old enough to remember when we lost the war of position in the 70s. It was full of energy, it was full of ideas. And then when I was 18, Thatcher got elected and she still is in power. You know, it goes on for, for ages. So that's where I just wanted to begin. The second is, you know, I'm really interested in, in engaging Kojo in, in what you said. There's different types of imperialism. And what's really the invisible thing in British imperialism is the distinctive role of the maritime trade, of the City of London in particular, and the particular forms of capitalism, of, of globalization that it engendered. Um, and that makes it different from the more territorial forms of imperialism under Spain and France. Uh, and that opened up a whole different dynamic and degree of space. So I want to go there. So the first distinction that I want to make really is between internationalism and globalization. And that if we start thinking that internationalism is global capitalism is enforced by treaty law through multilateral organizations, we're stuffed. And that's a really important um, thing to grab hold of. And the second is the distinction between nationalism and patriotism, which is worth investigating and looking at. Because nationalism is the absolute supremacy of a single, usually ethnic group. Patriotism is more like, how do we live in a shared polity that can be better than it is? How, do you, how can you be part of something, of something good? So and that's where it stands. And the real nature of the issue is a, a class issue. So Labour does very well at the moment among middle class people with degrees. And there's a huge amount of scepticism to Labour from, from working class people who don't really think, as John put it, that we're on their side that we're really engaging with them. And that's why I'm really hoping that we can articulate a genuine democratic vision of how Brexit can work, because that's one of the key default issues. In relation to, to citizenship, which, which Ash mentioned, for me, it's just a, it's a set of relationships with people who share a fate and a set of political institutions. That's, that's citizenship based on the liberty and equality of each person um, in that. So that's a very open thing and how do we develop the relationships between communities as well as individuals. So that's where I would say, and this is a really boring way I'm going to put it, but I can't put it another way. I think you're right about identity in epistemological terms, but not in terms of ontology. People feel part of things and act as part of things. And sometimes, like with the nation state, it's just something you inherit. So the distinction that I would make to you, the reason I don't like to describe myself as progressive is because I'm socialist. And socialist means that you recognize that there's a social inheritance, that we are social beings, that there's attachments and sense of belonging between people that is deeply political. And if you can build a wide solidarity around that, then you 
then you can win. So that there's an element in which the relationship between groups is vital in developing. Um, and that's where, with the progressive thing, it's much more of an enlightenment idea that we all do it exclusively as individuals. When I would say that if we look at ourselves as social beings, we think much more about coalitions between classes, coalitions between groups. And the key challenge before us is precisely how to build a genuine coalition between migrant communities and the descendants of migrant communities and the working class that was here before 45, that that coalition is the most vital aspect. And that's precisely, for example, where the ultimate progressive, Hillary Clinton, completely blew it. She couldn't make that coalition. Okay, so I've just been told that it's two minutes. So I've got to kind of concentrate on how to, to finish up. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll just do it there, that not to be afraid of this conversation, not to be afraid of the possibilities of democracy that emerge, that the key miracle of labor historically, people don't recognize this. In 1889 in the Dockers strike, which founded the labor movement, um, there was a coalition which maybe, maybe will mean something in Liverpool and perhaps Glasgow, but probably nowhere else in the country. There was a coalition between um, Catholic workers and Protestant workers, which had never existed before. That's the formation of the labour movement. Overwhelmingly, the Catholic workers were from the northwest and from Ireland, and they'd come down. A lot of them brought in as strike breakers. Protestant workers, overwhelmingly, from the southeast. What was distinctive about labour was that it brought those two communities together in a movement to protect the dignity of people, that they're not commodities. This was the language of it. So you had people like William Booth from the Salvation Army, Cardinal Manning from the Catholic Church, marching with the Dockers. And in the end, they won recognition from the dock owners and they created the Labour Representation Committees. In other words, Labour has been that movement that builds a common institution between people through which their humanity can be preserved from the domination of capitalism, but also from the state, from the oppression of the state and the homogenous power that it exerts. And so my heart is really full of hope about this. We know how to do it and we've done it before. And I think we're just gonna to have to do it again. Thank you very much to all our panellists. So I'm going to start by just sort of getting us all warmed up with a few questions that I've um, that kind of popped into my head and that I've prepared before, and then we're going to move on to um, the floor. So I kind of wanted to um, talk about this idea of winning, of winning elections, because the argument around, um, you know, this idea that we need to kind of embrace nationalism or patriotism um, is that, Labour needs to frame itself in these terms in order to gain back voters or in order to get voters that we are not getting at the moment. Um, so I just wanted to see what the panel thought of whether or not you ever worry about the voters that you might lose should this kind of patriotic, um, this particular kind of patriotism, or as many people would argue, a patriotism that is inextricable from particular racialized and gendered um, power relations. How do you feel about, you know, these kind of communities like young people, queer people, um, people of color who, for good reason, um, do not feel represented by these narratives? Do you ever worry that we might lose those votes, especially considering that they were so integral to um, the gaining of seats in the last election? Um, and also were so integral, you know, the fact that the Tories alienated those people was so integral to their loss of seats. So I just wanted to know what the panel thought about that. I mean, my aim is to construct a politics that includes those who feel that I was particularly talking about English, people who feel English, that includes that within the many. They feel excluded from it at the moment. Now the challenge is to do exactly, to avoid exactly what you said, to do that in a particular strident way 
or to use images and practices of Englishness that would be alienating to people. And the same would be of Britishness too. My, my real issue at the moment is that we almost willfully leave England out of the story. It's not that we go overboard in bringing England into the story. I'll just give you a classic example. Today we're going to nationalise the water industry. But that only makes sense in England because it's not run for profit in any other part of the union. Why don't we say England when we mean we're going to nationalise the water industry in England because that's the only place we're going to do it. We're going to have a national education service. What nation? Not Wales, not Scotland, not Northern Ireland, because they run their own education system. It's England. So very simple. What I'm calling for is actually not incredibly radical. It's actually thinking, calling things what they are. But it matters to those people who currently feel excluded. Now, I think there's a really important discussion here. I and mean, I have, can't go into details, not time. But I mean, in Southampton, I have four years' experience working with others to run an inclusive St. George's Day festival, precisely because... I didn't we want to be involved in a St. George's Day that was for one part of the community, because this is a national day. And to do that, you have to construct a story about Southampton and Englishness and it being built by all the people who've made their lives there. And then you do get participation from all communities, and people are pleased to be asked. You look at a lot of St. George's Day ceremonies on websites, including English Heritage, you won't find a single non-white face anywhere in their publicity. That is damaging. That is the wrong sort of thing to do. So I don't argue we have to have a really important debate about the practice of doing this. But if you say to me, can it be done in a way that doesn't alienate those people who say, well, actually, this stuff doesn't get, turn me on at all. Yes, I think we can do that. So, I mean, so you believe that we can. Ash or Kojo, do you have any responses to this idea? Do you think it is something that can be reclaimed? Or is it sort of from its genesis constructed in that particular way? So when you say, can this be reclaimed? I'd say, well, reclaimed by who and for what purposes? So this is what I mean by my, my focus here isn't on policing people's identity. So me and Kojo are both avid grime fans, and I'm sure that uh, Lord Glassman here is as well. Um, and what's, what has been really striking, and this is something that we've talked about a lot, is that in grime, there is a space for a particular uh, subversion of Englishness, right? You listen to Wiley's early work, and he sounds like a geezer. Do you know what I mean? You listen to, you know, you listen to AJ Tracy and, you know, it's like Stuart Hall's been writing a 616, right? He's talking about, you know, um, in Trinidad fam, I'm English, right? So it's actually about this kind of hybridized identity and it's there. My, it, my, so my issue isn't it with that. I find that tremendously inspiring. For me, the issue is, is what do you mean when you say an English radical history? What do you mean when you say an English history? Is it history that has happened to have taken place in England? Or is it the history of England as England? And for me, it's the England as England bit, which is the tricky part. And this is kind of why I'm calling to um, Grime and also thinking about Stuart Hall, is that there is no history of England as England. As Kojo says, it's been constituted in the international. And even before 1945, with the uh, you know, significant presence of working class people of color in this country, we were here in the form of commodities. This is the famous bit from Old and New Ethnicities, Old and New Identities by Stuart Hall. I'm the sugar at the bottom of the English cup of tea. What do you know about the English? They can't get through the day without a cup of tea. Others, if you're from uh, Sri Lanka or India, you're the tea itself. You're the outside history, in the inside history of the English. And for me, the issue is when you try and turn these things into political projects within these bounded forms, then you start cutting off that history. You start cutting off a history which has often been antagonistic. And you cut off, I think, some of the cultural richness which produces forms like grime. Aggie is all get out. And you make it sort of a bit like, oh, let's like put some brown faces and samosas in a St. George's Day celebration. I don't, I think it loses the thing which is, um, I, I think you lose what's exciting about it. To be fair. There wasn't a samosa in sight. And, no, 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 no. No, the point, the point, just quickly, because this, this is actually crucial. 
Because what we said, look, Southampton's an English city that's always been built by all the people who've made their homes there. That was an explicit story of an English history that set out to include it. So how did we do it for four years? We told the stories through videos, through performance, through drama of all the people who had made Southampton what it is today. So English history, yeah, it's, it happened in England, but it's not a defined set of certain things. Cable Street, I, let's not argue about this, English or British. Cable Street is part of that history. The Bristol bus boycott, where passengers from all backgrounds joined the boycott of the buses because the Transport and General Workers Union refused to let any black get a job on the buses. That's part of English history. And you see, we, we, if we don't deal with this, we can't make this part of our story today. I'm, I'm not a grime fan, but I'm one of those people of my age who sort of come across it. It seems to me it's the first authentic English or British folk music <laughs> since punk. It actually couldn't have been produced anywhere else in the world. That's part of our story. The last thing I would do is have a politics that shoved that into a corner somewhere. Sorry, that's a bit unfair. <laughs> and sort of draw it, drawing on that and, and kind of picking up on some of the things that came up there, um, another kind of inflection I wanted to put into that is, you know, Morris, you spoke a lot about how, um, you know, we need to bring people, like this idea of unity, we need to bring people together because that is the only way that we can, def you know, defeat global capital, which is what we all want, right? Hey. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but global capital is that, it's, it's global. So how, if our primary way of thinking about ourselves is through a nation, how does that connect us to the working classes globally who we need to be in solidarity with in order to defeat global capital. Okay, so that, you know, that's the, nut, that's the nub of it. How do you resist global capital? And I think we've reached the end of the road in thinking that this can be resisted through the rule of administrators and lawyers in undemocratic and unaccountable multinational organisations. It's got to be built, ultimately, on the building of relationships between working people of different backgrounds and generating a labour movement um, that can resist. That's the key distinction between internationalism and solidarity. So, so that, that in a way is fundamental. Just to go back to Kojo, and there was one event you missed out, because in the distinction between is the Norman conquest, you would have thought, just to say, campaigning in the referendum, you would have thought um, that the Norman conquest sort of happened yesterday as well. And that's, a, that's an English story uh, above all. So I've got a heretical view that the English history is more radical than British, that the British is the imperial story with the formation of the global empire and then the integration of, of Scotland in particular against France in that competition. But English history is a gradual, one, you know, one, one of the lines is, you know, in 1066, 98% of the land was handed over to 12 Frenchmen, you know and it's been pretty much uphill ever since. That's a framework within which you can understand dispossession, you can understand colonization, you can understand the incredible importance to English people in particular of land, because it happened again in the enclosures. In the enclosures, there was the absolute assertion of freehold title over customary practice, and the English peasantry was completely expelled from their land. That's another fundamental origin of the labor movement, was to reclaim some home in the world through democracy. So the answer to your question is the absolute solidarity with all democratic labor movements all over the world, with unions, but the idea that you can resist this without having those movements with, with power in the country um, is a shimmerer. And the, the second is to assert, and here I'm with Ash about the, the subordination of the primacy of identity to issues around democratic coalitions around class. That's an incredibly important part of that. So the choice before us is not a sort of liberal, administrative, progressive internationalism which, which doesn't exist. The choice before us is, in the democratic frame, are we going to have a nasty, xenophobic, right-wing nationalism that is in fact controlled by capital? Or are we capable here of actually articulating a democratic politics that can give inspiration and institutional support to other movements in the world. That's, that's the way I see it. Kojo, would you, would you like to come back on that? I mean, it's not, it's not the first time, I think, that we've heard this 
this claim and this campaign, the idea of reclaiming a radical, particularly English history, in opposition to the imperial legacy of the British Empire. Um, this is something that you can see from you know, great um, doyons of left-wing socialism from E.P. Thompson's, not only, um, you know, particularly his essay, The Peculiarities of the English, is one thing that's fantastic, where he talks about the idea of the English sensibility being particularly agreeable to revolution. You can think about George Orwell and the lion and the unicorn, socialism and the English genius, you know, so, again, you know what I mean? Very um, humble in its, in its articulation, um, but I... I mean, there's no denying, of course, that there's a radical history of things that have happened within the landmass of England, you know. And you can trace that. You can trace John Ball and the Pe Peasants' Revolt. You can trace Gerald Wynne Stanley. And you can plot together another national story that's more parochial, more kind of um, connected to um, the land and struggle, and use that as a replacement of a national story. My main issue with that is it goes back to the point that I was saying initially, is I don't know if it takes us closer to understanding the legacy of the British Empire for forming the political institutions and communities that we have today, whether it allows us to actually escape from those. It actually allows us to say, oh no, that wasn't us, that was the British Empire, and ignoring the, ignoring the, ignoring the significant role that England had within the configuration of Britain. So something that you were mentioning a little bit, John, was the silence of the idea of England when we talk about Britain. The silence when people talk about national projects, but ignoring the fact that it only reflects in England, and that is definitely true. There's no doubt that often legislation might be passed that's only going to affect England, but it's articulated as being a British issue. But that is because of the, the supremacist role that England played within that political configuration. The, the reason that the, there is a silence around England, the reason why there's not an English parliament and there is devolved governments within the other regions of the United Kingdom isn't simply because Englishness has been suppressed, but because Englishness has operated with such power that that power has been silenced and invisibilized. And so I think to, um, to simply to try and reclaim that and not ignore the way in which Englishness has been synthesized with imperialism is, is dangerous on, on both levels, and particularly on a level which um, I think both of you um, made something that's a key concern of yours in your presentations, this idea of constructing allegiances and constructing forms of bonding. And when I think about the idea, you know, if people want to identify as English, I think that's fantastic. And like Ash said, you know, I think it's great when you see a Kano video and he's in an East London, um, you know, greasy spoons and he's got a mug with a St. George's flag on. You know what I mean? It, it, it is exciting in its own way. But if we make that the kind of driving vehicle of our politics, I think I just I'm concerned about what happens to those who have allegiances that exceed the national boundaries. And it also, for me, does a disservice to that radical history of English socialism, which was always explicitly internationalist in a lot of ways, when you think about the, um, the commitment of those working class communities in places like here to go and fight in against the Spanish um, fascist forces in Catalonia. When you think about the way in which the anti-apartheid movement found its home here in England, I think it's the political coordinates of English leftism have not often been English, and I worry about making them so. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a huge amount there that that, that I, I agree with. Uh, and let me tell you how I square the, the circle and do it both in terms of identity and democracy, which Morris raised. Um, it's worth remembering in our history that in the 19th century and into the 20th century with the ILP, socialists conceived of the English nation, that meaning the people, not the state, important distinction, as a focus of opposition to capitalism and imperialism. And so the ILP talked about England as the place that could challenge capitalism and imperialism. We've forgotten that from our, from our history. But the particularly important thing you're right about is our institution, and I've written this in several things which are around at conference actually, um, our institutions were created for empire. And part of the crisis that we, is particular to the UK at the moment is that with the unwinding of empire, we are left with a set of imperial institutions that no longer have the empire to function. 
And actually, from the partition of Ireland in the 1920s through to Scottish and Welsh devolution, this has been a process of unwinding an imperial set of institutions that no longer work or give people a reason to be in one single state. I would argue that the particular crisis of England is England is stuck with the same imperial institution, no longer lording it over everybody in a way that undoubtedly happened in the past, but the only part of the UK that is run by the UK government rather than democratically by the people of England. I would argue that the reason it was England, not the rest of the UK, that provided the lion's share of the Brexit vote was that to a limited degree at least, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have been able to imagine themselves as modern 21st century post-imperial nations in a way that England has not been able to do because we have no fora in which that discussion takes place. Now the solutions we need, and you use a really important point about not making this a central point of our, our politics, I entirely agree. Ultimately, the political answers we come up with have to work democratically and for the majority, which are things that Morrison and I have both said. But if we don't include the people who do feel English in that project, we will lose part of our core constituency. So it's about inclusion of Englishness, not basing our politics around either a British or an English politics as, as though all the other things that we bring us to this conference don't matter to us because they do it's a vehicle for achieve, achieving that change sorry I mean I, th I think I would like to posit some questions and and these are intended as, as provocations as well as questions which is what is Englishness without whiteness what is Englishness without supremacy do we have models for thinking these through in any meaningful way and models of these identities which can um, reconcile themselves to um, Britain's changing role in the world so that can no longer sort of keep enjoying it's like you know when you wake up still drunk from the night before and that's shortly before the hangover hits. That's like, in, like Britain enjoying its colonial legacy on the world stage. Now we're in the hangover period. We're not just still coursing through on last night's Ray and Nephew. What conceptions of these, um, not just collective models of identity, but um, democratic institutions, social institutions, political institutions do we have without those things? I don't think that they've been thoroughly imagined. I think what we have had is instead attempt to define these things into being in a way which is still, I think, very much hoping that it will be taken as a lip surface to the patriotism, um, which is in inherently linked to a sort of imperial, not just amnesia, but um, nostalgia, the longing for something which is lost, and very much tied to the patriotism of a hope to return of um, domination. And I think that as as leftists, whether you're a socialist, whether you call yourself a progressive, whether in my case you call yourself a communist, we end up in a, in a strange position where we say, yes, we want to show that we are hearing you, forgotten Englanders screwed over by deindustrialization, in which people of colour are only ever an emblem of globalisation and not uh, demographics also affected and shaped by globalisation in this country. Where all we do is try and posit our politics as a form of lip service, of a yes, I'm hearing you, while then reassuring the anti-racist left, communities of colour, but this won't actually mean anything. Can I have a go? Keep it very short. Okay. You need to go into... My, my plea as much as anything is, is not to say I've got every single answer to that English story, but this is a story from which the left must not abstain. The left must not take a position to, and, and, of saying, until you've answered all my questions, I don't want anything to do with this. Because the world is changing, these identities are contested, it's up to us to decide whether we want to help resolve that in a way which actually produces the inclusive outcome that we want, or we don't. And the world is changing. I just, it's actually a bad choice of afternoon because I went to watch Southampton play Liverpool. I should have done something else. But Liverpool had a footballer called John Barnes. When John Barnes played for England and scored, many English supporters refused to count his goals as English goals because he was black. You saw it was different this summer. People are working out 
And sport isn't everything, a different form of Englishness. Now, we have an opportunity to include our radical history and the one things we want to see and the anti-racist struggles as part of the tale of England that we want to have. And if we just abstain because there's some difficult bits, we end up with a politics which doesn't include people that we do need to include.